All right. Since this podcast is about asking questions and trying to solve, um, trying to answer those questions by thinking as deep as possible about a lot of human behavior and why we do what we do. So let's get to it. And there is no better way of starting anything than to start with a story. So here's the story. Here's a little interesting story that I, I'm going to start with. In 2016, later half of 2016, I visited a, a, a small town in, in India um, as part of work. I was working with an organization which was catering to the retail segment of tier two, tier three cities, um, tier two, tier three, in fact, villages often. Um, and trying to cater to the retail segment of of um, retail side of these um, villages, right? And as part of that, I ha- I was traveling to a lot of tier two, tier three cities. I was based in Bangalore, which is a tier one city in India, extremely populated, like it's about ten million people in about seven hundred square kilometers. I mean that's. It's almost the size of Singapore, but twice the population for some context, right? That's how populated it is to traveling to villages where the population is very, very less. So I had traveled to one of these villages and I was working there and I was talking to retailers and um, talking to a lot of distributors and something interesting happened. When I was there, I mean, all, in, in all of these tours, in all of these trips that I had gone to, I noticed something peculiar and consistent across all these villages. And that is, one, things are extremely slow, <laughs> right? So people work slower, people work less. Um, there's less trade that happens at a retail store less number of less footfall on every store less trade that happens and people start off late shut down early people go back home um, people drive slower people talk slower everything is just slow it's almost like my life had suddenly switched from 1x to maybe like 0.8 or 0.7x But also with it was something else that I noticed. Consistently across all my visits to the rural parts and the tier 2, tier 3 cities of India, consistently I noticed that people are happier. By far, majority of them are happier than the majority of people in a tier one city like Bangalore. I'd also traveled to Mumbai and I have been in Delhi for a very long time and I've noticed something similar, right? These are tier one cities that we're talking about. The stress levels are pretty high compared to the stress levels of villages in India. Okay? That is something that I consistently saw across all my travels in, 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 within the rural parts of India. And I started to question why that is the case. And here's something that I figured out. I've, I, I just wanted to share these findings with you. So one, we as human beings, the reason for us to be happy are a couple of things. And the most important one is the expectations not just the expectations that we have with ourselves. The expectations that we have with ourselves is, is again, it's, it's a pretty ridiculous term in itself, right? So that's, again, very, very relative. You will have a different set of expectations if you're living in, in a village with your own self versus you living in a city, you would have a different set of expectations for yourself, Right? So the expectations stemming out of ambition are, you know, the one of the primary reasons for happiness or unhappiness or it sort of commands the happiness levels, the stress levels in an individual. 
But then I wanted to go a bit deeper into this. I wanted to understand how we have come to these expectations and how these expectations vary with places. How does the demography of a place define the happiness of the people? How, how does being tier 1, tier 2, tier 3 define how happy you are as an individual? People in villages have been known to live longer. People in cities, tier 1 cities, have been known to live much less, have been known to um, fall sick, have been... the the. Uh, the age when they die is much less for people living in cities as compared to people living in villages. Like this, there has to be clearly has to be something, and I wanted to get to the roots of it. So here's me taking you to the roots of it. We as human beings, a few thousand years ago, we started building societies for ourselves. We started grouping together when we were apes forming groups of people with um, uh, with skills um, um, that the other people like I would group in a in a I would be part of a group where I see that um, the skills that I do not have other people have so we would sort of make that group as part of survival and for us to survive forming those groups was very important for us to because all of us had to age and all of us had to die for us to survive and for us to reproduce forming these groups became very very important and with forming these groups came forming societies and as time passed like as as we went from se- went through centuries of um, time and evolution of human beings these things kept changing the societies kept changing the groups kept changing the groups that we formed among ourselves kept changing the meaning of survival also kept changing with the time. We're talking millions of years now, right? Thousands of years ago, when we were forming societies at, at large, like we were forming countries now, right? Um, land and anything that separated, uh, that was separated by water seemed to be part of one group and someone somewhere wanted to organize the whole set of people that were there and that's how we started forming governments that's how we started forming kingdoms and that's how we started forming countries all in the name of governing a set of people a group of people now when we became more and more people right as the population grew There was a need for more resources. A place in Africa had enough wood, but then they probably did not have enough stones. I mean, just for example, right? They did not have enough stones. So what they would do is they would travel to a nearby land across the sea, across the ocean, They would travel to the nearby land in search and in exploration of something that they needed, which is stone. And then there they would find another set of people who were abundant in stones. So, and they were probably not welcome because it's something that's theirs. It's stones that's theirs, right? So they would have to fight and get it. Again, survival of the fittest. So from surviving for food and water in the early ape stages where we had to form groups so that our skills are complementing each other so that we can gather enough food and water for ourselves and survive through tough times. From then to societies and countries when we started fighting with each other just so that we can acquire 
more resources, more wood, more stone, more land, more infrastructure, more and more and more of everything. It's not greed, but that's how survival turned out to be. If you're running a company, if you're running a country, if you're running a kingdom, and you see your kingdom is exploring because people are the number of people are growing. There's population explosion in your kingdom, in your country, in your state. The obvious next step would be to expand to the nearby places so that you can comfortably live. Your society is growing. And it was it was a nice thing. It's a nice thing to do, right? But the only problem is when resources start to fall short, that is, not just to feed your own society, but also a place to stay. That's where we started um, fighting for those resources. Now, again, all of it in the name of survival. Like, I want you to remember this word, survival. I'm just going to link all of our actions throughout history to survival. We fought wars. We killed other people so that we could take their lands. We could take their resources so that our people, our group, our society can survive. Societies, um, the meaning of society is just not a group of people who are demographically populated in a place, right? <laughs> meaning of society changed. With that, with just a group of people, um, you know, demographically populated in a certain place, came certain set of beliefs. As more and more people kept coming in, these belief systems kept varying. And we started to see a shift in how the belief system was across the globe. Like there, there was a difference in how people believed about something. There was a difference in how people believed in God. There was a difference in how people believed in resources. There was a difference in how people believed in other people. We fought wars. Not just we started fighting wars, not just to get resources, not just to survive based on the needs of the population in your society, in our society. We started fighting because there was a difference of opinion, and we wanted to show it to the rest of the rest of them that our belief system is better. Not to fight with them. Not to eradicate a society so that you could take away resources. Just to establish yourself as the leader in thought process. So you're bigger and you're better because of something. You're bigger and better because of your color. You're bigger and better because of religion. People fought wars. I mean, we're still fighting wars based on religion, based on um, your belief system. Because we as human beings have to prove that we are better. It's innate in us. And that shift, that's the definition of survival now. I mean, it has shifted from the need to have food and water to the need to be better. Now, why do you have to be better? Why do you have to be better in something? Why do you have to be, to prove it to the rest of them that you're better? So to answer this, here's a quick example. Going back to the ape stages, the time when we were apes, the weakest of them I mean, that's something true even even in, in a lot of wild animals today. Like even tigers kill their weak cubs. Still happens in the animal, animal stages. So when we were apes, we, the, the weakest 
a child would get eliminated from the family. The weakest child would get eliminated from the family some way or the other. So if there are five children in a family, every children ended up competing to be better so that they could be in the top two, top three. So that if there were two children who had to be abandoned, who had to be left behind when the entire family moved from one place to the other, they would not be those two children. So these five kids, these five little apes, five little monkeys started competing with each other. Now, this translates to a time now where we groups of people are competing based on our belief system, based on our religion, based on our caste, based on our race, based on the technology we use, based on the kind of talent we have, based on, you know, just so many things, just based on color of the skin, you know, based on which school you've graduated from. How many times do you see people comparing each other? I mean, how many times have you met someone and you've, you've, you shook their hand and you've asked them, which school did you graduate from? And then they proudly say they've graduated from Harvard, Stanford, IAT, IAM. We are proud of that. We as human beings still have this need to prove it to the other person, to prove it to everyone around us that we are better. Question is, we are better at what? What are we better at? Are we better at education? Are we better at um, the way we perform? Are we better athletes? Are we better at physical activities? Are we better at mental activities? Are we better at talking to people? What are we really better at? Are we better in acting? Are we better in social skills? Are we better hunters? Are we better gatherers? Are we better cooks? Are we better entertainers? How are we better? My point is, we wanted to, we as human beings wanted to prove that we're better. Right? We wanted to prove that we're better than everybody else. Or if I meet you, I, I will have this innate urge to prove it to you that I'm better than you. Now, just to prove it to you, I will invent something <laughs> that I'm really good at that you're probably not even aware of. Right? You may be the best, the most educated person on this planet. But shit, I'm a better dancer. So hey, here's my hand. It was nice meeting you. But I'm a better dancer. And the person in front of me would be like, Shh, nice meeting you, but hey, I'm smarter. You know, you see how these interactions begin to happen? And once we started comparing each other, once we started fighting with each other. I mean, this is not something that happened recently. This happened as part of our evolution. This happened from the ape stages. This happened as long, many, many million, millions and years, millions of years ago. And that that is still innate. That has become an innate part of human beings. And that is what we still have as a survival instinct. You see, we still have countries and governments fighting for, based on, you know, religion. That's still going on. Right? We have, we still have racism in many parts of the world. We still have people, we still have white people who think that they are better. They're just superior than black and brown folks. That kind of thought process still exists. People may not realize it, but that's the underlying belief. I mean, not just white people, even black folks have this underlying belief that white people are better. 
brown folks think that black and white people both are better. There is an underlying belief system that is um, sort of ingrained in our head. Muslims think they're better. Christians think they're better. People who have graduated from certain school think they're better. Doctors think they're better because they save lives. Capitalists think they're better because they save economies. If there is no economy, there would be no population, there would be no structure. And without a structure, there would be chaos. And with chaos, there would be nothing. There would be no education. There would be no doctors. Governments think they're better because they're the one putting things together. Without them, there would be no structure. There would be no education system. There would be no doctors. There would be no scholars. There would be nothing. Capitalism has made us create multiple currencies. Has made us create another scale. Like another scale which is a very relative scale. Dollars and euros and rupees and baht's and dinars and what not. All of these are relative. They keep changing in value. The money keeps circulating from here and there. The, these values keep changing, but the, um, the, the ego that associates with that value, that also keeps changing over a period of time as these currencies change, right? So America would call itself um, the strongest economy in the world and be proud of it. Whereas Japan would call itself the technological capital of the world and be proud of it. Singapore or London would call itself, um, you know, the financial capital of the world. Be proud of it. India, China would call itself uh, the IT capital of the world and be proud of it. What do, what do these things mean when it comes to actual genuine happiness what do we as it professionals what do we as capitalists what do we as um, educators as teachers as doctors as um, just rich kids or as Something. What do these entitlements mean to human happiness? And what do, what do these things have to do? How are they different from people living in the cities to people living in villages? We have doctors in the cities. We have doctors in villages as well. Both of them carry this prestige that they're doctors. They're saving the world. They're saving human beings. And that's something... They, they cannot be a more noble cause. And that's why they're better. Right? How would you say that a doctor in a village is happier than a doctor in a city? The answer is yes. I mean, it's obviously yes. But is it because there are less diseases in, in, in a small village? And more diseases in in a big city or more number of patients in a big city? No, that's not the answer. The the answer to this, as we evolved human humans, right, comes back to the way we have evolved and the fact that how population explosion has impacted all of us. Now, coming back to the basic survival instinct that we have now. Right. Now that we've established how survival instinct has progressed from how we were in apes uh, as apes to how the survival instinct is now as whatever we are, 21st century human beings. So now that we've established that survival instinct now is to be better at something, right? We have social media influences for God's sake who are better 
than everyone else. We have an entire generation and probably many more generations to come of people who are on social media, who are social media influencers, who have the attention of the people. And with attention comes money. So they have the attention of the people and the attention of capitalists who want to invest, who want to rotate the money. So they make money. And we have all these people who are better at influencing other people. Who are better at... And because they are better at influencing people, they get brands. So, we just have different, different channels, right? That's the point. So now, we will go ahead and invent more and more channels. Probably in the next 50, 100 years, we will have so many more channels where... Everyone gets to compete in each of these channels and everyone gets to be better. Everyone gets to be in the top 1%. Everyone wants to be in the top 1%. That's survival of the fittest. That's what Charles Darwin said. But that doesn't answer the fundamental question of why a doctor in a village is more happier than a doctor in a city, in a tier one town, tier one city. The answer to this is this. A city like Bangalore has about 10 million people. A small village adjacent to Bangalore would probably have 100 people living in that village. As human beings, we have to compete with the rest of them, something, right? 10 million people, there are many things that you're competing with, competing, uh, the, the different things that you're competing uh, on will keep varying, right? 10 million people, so more number of things that you can compete on, but then there are also equally higher number of people in those individual um, racetracks, Right, And let's say there are 10 racetracks. So there are a million people on each racetrack. You still have to compete with a million. Versus in a village where you have 100 people and you probably have just two racetracks. Two fundamental things that people are competing on. It could be education. It could be... Um, Probably with just 100, it just could be, you know, they have agricultural land and it's a bunch of farmers. So who produces more every year, every season? So they're comp competing on that. Who makes more money, right? So with a couple of fields that people are competing on, with a couple of racetracks, you're essentially competing with what? 30, 40, 50 people. And that number is much less than a million. That number is much less than a thousand, in fact. And because you're competing with less number of people, the odds of you being in the top 1% is also higher. Now, this top 1%, mind you, is very, very relative. The top 1% is relative to the kind of racetrack you're part of. And that racetrack is relative to where you are. If we look at it demographically, the racetrack is, is, is relative to which society you belong to. Right? It could be relative to which religion you belong to. But then, whatever it is that you decide to uh, choose as your racetrack that you want to compete on, you have if you have less number of people to compete with, your happiness index goes up because your stress levels are down pretty much. You, don't, you have to compete with 1 million people. You have to work really, really hard to be in that top 1%. People try to get into IITs. IIT is a premier institute, engineering institute in India. So many people apply for the JE exam and only a few of them get in. Only the top 1% get 
gets in. I don't know if it's 1% or 10%, but it's only the top one cream layer that gets in, right? So many people try to give the government exam and join the Indian government as government servants, as IAS or IPS. So many try and join the army. All of these have limited, limited seats. And so many of us compete for those limited seats. And only the top layer of cream gets in. Likewise, in a village of 100 people with probably two engineering colleges and four schools, students from these four schools are competing to get into one of these engineering colleges. And they would be really happy if they get into one of these engineering colleges because if they don't, then they either don't go to college at all or they go to a nearby village and then they travel and go to another college, which is something um, that they would want to consider as plan B, right? So you see from their perspective, the race is to, um, from a, a set of, let's say 50 students in a village of the 100 people. In a set of 50 students split across four schools, you have to compete with those 50 students to get into um, two colleges. That's the race. And that way, things are slower, people are happier. The point being, a city like Bangalore with about 10 million people in it, city like Bangalore where, is, where there is so much capital, so much IT boom that has happened in the past few years. A city like Bangalore which um, has employees with really high spending capacity. A city like Bangalore where which is ex continuously still exploding and more and more companies coming to Bangalore and more and more money being pumped into Bangalore attracts more population to a city like this. More population leads to lesser happiness. Look at, look at this globally. Like look at India and China. The two countries that have the highest number of population in the entire world. I mean, they're very close. China is about 1.5 billion. India is about 1.3 billion. Maybe more now. Maybe my stats are a little outdated, but there may be more now. But then they're pretty close. And these are the two most populated countries in the entire world. And what you see in these two countries that is different from the rest of the rest of the countries in the entire world is these two countries work really, really hard. The people in these countries work really, really hard. And that's why we have a lot of American and European and um, uh, Middle Eastern companies have their offshores in India and China, have their manufacturing set up in China, have their um, IT professionals working out of the Indian office. The reason is things are just so much better because Indians and Chinese work harder. I mean, that's the global perspective. The reason they work harder is because they have so many people to compete with. The reason they produce better is because they have to be better. They're not competing with the Americans. Indians are competing with Indians. Chinese are competing with Chinese to be better so that they get the right opportunity so that they get paid well. That's the race. And because of that race, the quality is better, of course, but the stress levels are also higher. Go to New Zealand, for example. I was recently in Singapore. And Singapore is about the same size as Bangalore. And it's the population is half of what the population of Bangalore is. The entire country, Singapore, has half the population of Bangalore. An interesting thing about that is you could clearly see the difference, not just 
while you're walking on the road. I mean, obviously, the traffic is less, the number of people is less, the roads are cleaner, the streets are cleaner, everything else is cleaner. The government is so much better, the government has so much capital, the the, the companies are so well organized, the, the government is running the whole show so beautifully. I mean, it's just so much easier to manage. True. All of that is there. There is unemployment in Singapore as well. But... The difference is, again, I mean, Singapore would not be the best example because Singapore is sort of dominated by uh, a lot of um, um, people from the Chinese origin who already are hard workers because they are from the Chinese origin. But having said that, Singapore is better than Bangalore in so many ways. Also, the happiness index of Singapore is so much higher. People are happier. People go to work. People don't slog. People go to work. People come back home. They go out. They party. They have their drinks. They have parties every day in Singapore. People have their drinks. They go out. They spend time with their family. And that's how Singapore culture rolls. A lot of um, companies um, who have APAC headquarters, the Asia-Pacific headquarters in Singapore, they do have the asia I mean, Singapore is sort of the financial hub of the world. Like it's If, if it's not the financial hub already, it's going to become the financial capital of the entire world. People outsource, people have their APAC headquarters here, Asia-Pacific headquarters here in Singapore. But then, from a talent point of view, they still outsource it to India. From a manufacturing point of view, they still outsource it to China. The reason is, people work harder. More number of people, more competition, higher stress, probably high productivity, but less happiness. So, um, concluding this quick podcast is one question that I want to ask all of you all of you listening to this podcast. How else do you think is our happiness as human beings impacted? Other than the reasons that I've mentioned in this podcast, how else do you think at a fundamental level, how else do you think our happiness is impacted? Let me know. Hit me up on Instagram, Snapchat, social media, you know, I should be available everywhere. So if you don't see me on any social media platform, hit me up on some other social media platform and let me know. I'll join that. And I just want to reach out to as many people as I can. Hit me up, let me know. And we can pick that up for our next podcast. Until then, See ya. Sayonara. Bye-bye. Take good care.